So I think there's lots of things to, to pick on there. But I think if you wanted to harp on Rattler, the offensive line, the running backs, or the defense itself, I'm not going to say that you can't. Yeah, I mean, that's the biggest issue here is that there are a multitude of things you could point at after this game and say, yikes, that's not good. But at the same time, I mean, that's what's to come with this kind of a season. I mean, it's kind of like I mentioned on the college football deal to Trey Scott. Anyone who didn't expect some growing pains from this team or Spencer Rattler specifically just wasn't facing reality at its face value. I mean, I also hold the take that I still feel like we have undervalued how much Kenneth Murray meant to this football team. Yes, they did not generate those takeaways that you mentioned, but I also have a hard time believing that Kenneth Murray would not have at least stopped or said something to prevent this outcome. And, and so I, I look at this game and I can obviously see why a lot of people are going to smash that panic button. And it is justifiably so. I mean, Oklahoma was about to head into a gauntlet that you may or may not have included Kansas State in. My biggest issue here is where was all of this before then? I feel like a lot of people weren't necessarily examining some of the issues that this squad had going into the season, and maybe some of us were culprits of that. I felt like, though, we really had to take this team for what it is. And as I mentioned to the guys at GoPowerCat.com or whoever else, this is very much still a gap year for OU, and this was probably the first opportunity for us to see that in its reality. I, I, I expect m not necessarily more of the same moving forward, but look, man, this is going to be a really tough season for OU, and it, it only gets more difficult as they get ready to face Iowa State, Texas, TCU, and the like. I actually want to talk a little bit about Texas and Texas Christian uh, a little bit later on because that's a, that's a tremendously big game, even for OU. I'll explain that in a little bit. But looking ahead to Iowa State, it's already clear that they want this game. And I'm thinking about this from the standpoint of hunting versus hunted. Like, you ask any coach in America, they want to be the underdog. They like chasing. They like hunting. Everybody likes hunting. Nobody likes running away from people that are trying to kill them. Iowa State has to feel good about itself because it felt like they found their offense against uh, Texas Christian, which – is not a difficult thing to do to find your offense against Gary Patterson in that 425, where you see Garrett Wallow and you see these players that you know are going to play NFL football. Then you add to that, Brees Hall has been a tremendous player. The way that I was talking about Deuce Vaughn the first six weeks, I say first six weeks, the last six weeks, is the way he was talking about Brees Hall last year because, you know, that 2019 class. The number one player in the state of Kansas is Marcus Hicks, who's on the shelf at Oklahoma, and I think he's going to be a game changer once he gets healthy to play. The number two player was Brees Hall, and he ends up at a place where they know how to turn out tailbacks. And Brees Hall is already putting together a better career than David Montgomery, and most people will tell you David Montgomery, hell of a running back at Iowa State, hell of a running back for the Chicago Bears. So outside of Brock Purdy and Brees Hall, who are you going to watch for for Iowa State? Uh, Jaquan Bailey, I am so excited about this matchup, RJ. And let me tell you why. I witnessed Jaquan Bailey in the first week of the season as Iowa State collapsed in that opening loss to Louisiana. Hurdle a grown man in pass rush. Like, if you don't process that with your brain, let me explain a little bit more in depth, people at home. This man was rushing the quarterback full speed and jumped over a running back nonchalantly while going after the guy with the football. I don't think that that actually is like something that normally happens ever. I have never seen that before in my life, but he did it and he did it with ease. And then he went on in the game against TCU to absolutely eat their lunch. I mean, TCU's offensive tackles. It's clear that they're a problem right now. Austin Myers specifically at left did not have a great football game, but I would also say a lot of that had to do with the fact that Jaquan Bailey might just be the best defensive end in the Big 12. He is a guy going into this game. I can't wait to see how he matches up with those offensive tackles that we mentioned. Adrian Ely, probably one of the guys you might feel a little bit more comfortable with at this stage on that Oklahoma offensive line. 
because I think the interior got a little bit embarrassed, and obviously the left tackle spot is weak. But whether he matches up with Ely or the left tackle position, whoever it might be, he's going to have the advantage. He is the better play. And I need to see how Oklahoma tries to mask him in protection. Does it mean they have to utilize the running backs or tight ends? Because it's clear to me you're not going to win on that guy one-on-one. Jaquan Bailey is a guy that Oklahoma fans need to be very concerned about going into this game because I have a very strong indication he's going to leave his impact on the outing. And if he does so, it's going to be hard for Oklahoma's offense to generate anything, especially in the passing game with a redshirt freshman QB who heard plenty of footsteps and let it be evident. Jaquan Bailey is one of those players that feels like he's been here for 10 years, you know, kind of like Sam Edward, yeah. right? And, and there's a number of players across the league that feel like they've been playing for that long because they, they really have. They were early contributors as freshmen, and then they just never gave up jobs. I mean, uh, along with the guys like Mike Rose, right? And, uh, Greg Aysworth, uh, excuse me. Like, they just feel like they've been there forever. And Jaquan Bailey having three and a half sacks, I don't give a damn who he's playing against. You, you got three and a half sacks in a football game. You're a player. And not just, right? not just a player, but like, yo, Marcus Major, uh, Seth McGowan, TJ Pledger. You can't just dive at this dude's knees, all right? Because that's exactly the kind of image you're talking about when Jaquan Bailey's just going to jump over. You're going to make it easy. That's one, that, that bugged me the most is when you would ask the running backs to block None of them had hands to go and throw a chest at, right? They were all trying to just roll into somebody's knees. And I'm looking for you to do that because that's easy. All I got to do is step over you. That's that's fine. You don't get to do that with Jaquan Bailey. And certainly, as we've been hitting on all year, and we will probably could hit on for the rest of the year, left tackle is a problem. Because if I am John Haycock, yo, Jaquan, that left side of their line, that's yours. Eat. Eat, homie. That's all you. Right, we we gonna we gonna drop we gonna drop eight. We're gonna play our zone. We're gonna tackle people, put them on the ground, and you you just go beat the hell out of that left tackle, okay? Because it's clear that they're not going to be able to block you, and you're going to probably vault into the NFL off of this tape because everybody knows what Lincoln Riley's offense is supposed to do. Which is the other thing that I find to be interesting about where we're headed for OU football offensively. Like a couple years ago. Barry Trammell asked Lincoln Riley at Big 12 Media Days with Baker being gone and bringing in Jalen, or excuse me, Kyler being gone and bringing in Jalen, do you expect the offense to take a dip? To which Riley adjusted his tie, kind of grunted, and said, we don't expect the offense to take a dip. And it didn't, right, for the most part. Like, they put up 44 points a game, but is it the 47-48 that they had been? No. This might be the first year for which Oklahoma doesn't average 40 points per game. 